ready for you. Okay. All right, man. So we have a special night tonight. <clears throat> we have a uh, uh, brother, Jim Cooper, is going to give his share his testimony tonight. But I'm going to go ahead and introduce the ministry, and then we'll move forward with this with this uh, brother Jim's testimony. Amen. We got brother Big Randy here. He can he'll do a favor and pray his sin. Amen. But let me introduce the ministry. Uh, the Tabernacle of Meeting, Help from Above. Scripture is Revelation 21.3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Right? Revelation 21.3 once again. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. The tabernacle that Moses was told to set up while wandering in the wilderness represented the, the dwelling place of God in this earth. But, but this tabernacle is of God is the reality of his presence, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. The essence of God's desire and man's purpose. God's desire is to live in close fellowship with man, and man's purpose is to be a people unto God. The next scripture we have is, Psalm 51, 10 through 12, it's, it's the Psalm of David uh, that David wrote. It's a repented psalm. Here we see David, God's chosen king, sin by having relations with another man's wife, Bathsheba. But God has something to say about David's abuse in power and sends his prophet Nathan to call David out, to call David out to repentance. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan uses a story to illustrate the seriousness of David's sin. And it's effective in calling David to repentance. There are still repercussions from his sin. But because Nathan spoke the truth, David repented and avoided bringing further punishment on Israel. And so he wrote, he wrote uh, Psalm 51, 10 through 12 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me. With a willing spirit. Notice that after the sin with Bathsheba, he says, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Lord, give that back to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. Amen. The next scripture we have is Acts chapter 16. We have the story of the Philippian jailer that chained up with Paul and Silas uh, where they were thrown into prison for preaching Jesus in the street when they were told not to. But God sent his angel and uh, shook up the prison. These chains were broken. These men were set free. But the Philippian jailer cried out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Right? And Paul and Silas responded. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Man, just believe, and you will be saved, you and your household. Is any among you afflicted due to alcohol, due to depression, to anger, divorce, drug abuse, death of a loved one, mixed marriages, abandonment? Know that God loves you and awaits for you to respond, to respond to the call, right? God says, hey, I have a calling in your life. Experiencing God's call may be a process, but answering is Answering his call requires a definite decision, right? A delayed obedience is disobedience. A delayed obedience is disobedience, right? God says, hey, I have a calling in your life. Amen. That's the tabernacle meeting, help from above. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move forward with uh, uh, Hermano Randy. He's going to do us a favor and pray a sin. And then we'll move forward with uh, uh, Jim, Brother Jim, uh, his testimony for tonight. Amen. 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 Let's pray, everybody. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to come before you right now because you are our God, you are our Savior, you are our friend, and you, you're up above and you, you're helping us right now to achieve your word, to know your word. 
and the truth that sets us free, Lord. And Lord, today I want to lift up my brother, Mr. Cooper here. I want to ask that you just let it all hang out, Lord. Just let him all hang out the way he wants to hang out, the way he wants to be, the way he wants to say it, Lord. And just talk about your love and how you got to know him, Lord. We love you, Lord. We know you got a plan and purpose and a reason for this testimony. So, Lord, let your light so shine before us tonight. And let all things work together for the good to those that love you and are called upon your purpose. We love you, Lord. Thank you for letting us do this. In the name that's above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen, bro. Thank you. Thank you, hermano. Thank you. Um, you know, we waited for this testimony for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jim, you know, I mean, he knows we've been trying to get, uh, I've been trying to get his testimony on the air. Uh, he shared his testimony many times with me. Um, and, you know, I just thank God. I really thank the Lord for allowing this to come to pass uh, because I prayed against the powers of darkness. And, you know, Jim got sick one time a while back when we were going to bring this forward. And then, you know, but we know the enemy is a liar. He's the father of all lies. You know, he comes to seek and to destroy. And, you know, I thank the Lord. I really thank the Lord that he allowed this. You know, like I said, you know, I had no weapons formed against my brother here is going to prosper. You know, God, God restored his health back to him, you know, so he can come and give his testimony tonight. You know, that's, that's, you know, that's the God that we serve, you know. Um, but here it is. It's, 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 it's a testimony is known as a, as a conversion story, right? A testimony is known as a conversion story. A person's journey to becoming a Christian, it is, it's telling someone else about your relationship with God. A life dedicated to Christ is a powerful, a powerful testimony, right? And, and, and in scripture, it teaches us that the heavens rejoice over one sinner who repents. Right. Every time you tell your story about how you came to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you give glory and honor to him. He is greatly pleased with you. Notice that God is greatly pleased. You honor God. And you, by, by, you know, you, you honor, you give, you give glory and honor to him. He is greatly pleased with you, right? Once again, every time you give your, every time you tell your story about how you came to have a personal relationship with, with the Lord, Jesus Christ, you give glory and honor to him. And that's what we're doing tonight. Tonight, we're here to give glory and honor to the Lord. Right? Yes, sir. It says, your story is the key that can unlock someone else's prison. Only God can turn a mess into a message and a test into a testimony. And I believe that's what our test, that's what our testimony is. <laughs> you know, because, you know, there's a, there's a statement that says, that says, uh, um, you know, it's about, uh, it's about school. You know, the difference between school and the difference between life. Right. <clears throat> I mean, in school, you're giving a test, right? You're at school, and the teacher's, you know, putting up the, you know, the, this is the test, of, you know, this is the, um, the test for for Friday or Thursday or whatever. She writes it up on the board, right? Right. Um, and you know, the test is going to be on Friday or Thursday, but she writes it up on the board, right? <clears throat> but in life, you're giving a test. That teaches you a lesson, you know, because in school, right, she's writing up the lesson. OK, this is the lesson for the test on Thursday or Friday. I remember being in school sometimes, you know, sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, that, but that reminded, that's what that reminded me of. Right. The, the teacher's writing up the lesson on the, on, the, on the board. And she says, this is this is the lesson for the test on Thursday or Friday. Right. But in life, 
you're giving a test that teaches you a lesson, right? <clears throat> I mean, I remember my time. I mean, in my testimony was like, I mean, I've been busted four times. The first time I didn't listen. Second or third time I didn't listen. You know, but the fourth time is when God did a miracle in my life. You know, my wife spoke it into my life. I had just gotten out the fourth time. And my wife says, what else do you want to happen to you? She said, give your life to the Lord. You know, why are you running from him? And I surrendered my life to the Lord. And he does, he's done a great, you know, he's, he's delivered me from drugs, alcohol, porn. I mean, just, you know, you name it, you know. Um, but, um, but she spoke it into my life. And that's how I got saved. That's how my relationship with God began, you know. Um, but let's hear your, your testimonies for tonight. So let's, <laughs> we're, we're bringing uh, Hermano Jim Cooper. We want to uh, listen to your testimony tonight. I believe it's a powerful testimony. I believe it's going to help someone else. You know, like it says right here, um, you know, that, that, uh, that your story is the key that can unlock someone else's prison. Only God can turn up a message, a mess into a message, you know, because somebody might be listening, you know, people that be listening to this channel, they're, they're, um, you know, they, they, they need to hear this, this, this testimony of yours, because our, our testimony might, you know, help someone else come out of their prison, you know, is how can I do that? I mean, how can I, you know, I mean, and that's what our test is, you know, our test is, 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 is our encounter with the Lord Jesus. You know, once again, a, a testimony is known as, as a conversion story, a person's journey to becoming a Christian. It's telling someone else about your relationship with God. A life dedicated to Christ is a powerful testimony. And I believe Jim's, Jim's uh, uh, testimony tonight, it's going to affect many lives. I, I believe it's a powerful testimony. You know, once again, I thank the Lord for allowing this to come to pass. We waited for such a long time. Only God knows that we waited for such a long time. And yeah. I think that today's the day that the Lord has made. You know, we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. So, um, um, once again, a testimony is how a person encountered the God of the Bible the testimony of how Christ came into my life and made a different and made me a different person. So how did your encounter with Christ make you a different person? How does your you want to share your start with your testimony? Well, I'm going to do this with some back flashes. Okay. Okay. Flashbacks. They call it in the movie industry. Mm -hmm. um, on August 2nd, 1978, I experienced a, a profound, powerful spiritual upheaval that, that turned my life around. And, and from that day till this, I've become the changed person that we were just talking about. And I've had um, countless opportunities to share my story with other people because of a, another fellowship that I also belong to. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I shared that story with people who suffered from the same problems that I do did, but um, I mean God God was tugging at me from the time I was little, and and I grew up in Whittier. Uh, my dad was a construction superintendent. My mom was a housewife. Uh, they had a, what today they call a dysfunctional relationship, you know, mm -hmm. toxic. I called it. <laughs> But um, but I remember uh, there, there's a little Methodist church over here in Whittier, over on Cole Road, just south of Whittier Boulevard. And when I was four or five years old, uh, mom was mostly going to church every Sunday over there. And mm -hmm. then I'd go up there and they'd send me back to Sunday school. But I, I remember the day I was baptized. And the, the pastor of that church, his name was Reverend Ray Worth. And I remember that. And I was four or five years old, but I still remember that. And I remember the ceremony and standing in front of a lot of people. And at that age, I didn't want to be in front of a lot of people. But, you know, I just felt clumsy and awkward and out of place, which I felt for much of my life anyway. And um, so th that's how I got started. My parents 
were, were Methodist. And so I was Methodist and um, kind of like my parents were Democrats. So I was a Democrat until my eyes were open, you know, and um, <laughs> that, right. that, that came later in life. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but I mean, we started out doing church every Sunday and then coming home and mom would make breakfast and everything. And, and those were, those were good days. And um, as we aged from when I was 12 years old, we had moved up to Idaho Falls, Idaho. My dad was a uh, superintendent on a, a nuclear project up there for two years. So I was in sixth grade and I started going to the, the Methodist um, confirmation classes. And this was, uh, it was every Sunday night and it was in the first part of the year, I think and ended right, right near Easter. That's a long time ago, so I don't remember exactly, but I remember um, the, the thing I liked most about that confirmation class was we would have a couple of breaks during the class. And during those breaks, instead of sitting around and all the kids in the class were pretty much my age, you know, 12 and 13, um, I, I would walk down into the sanctuary of the church, which was empty and dark, and there were a few lights on. And, and I would sit there and, and just contemplate, you know, I, it's like I could feel the, the power of God in that room. And there was nobody else in there but me. And once in a while, I would talk to him. And then I'd go back and, uh, and finish the confirmation class. But it wasn't long after that confirmation that my parents were, um, probably long before that, they were starting to have problems. And um, the things got bad around the house. And, and my dad was a kind of a violent man sometimes with my mother. And I remember um, I was starting to fall away from the church then, you know, I stopped after the confirmation class. I pretty much quit going back to church. And, but I remember times when I was laying in bed at night and I was, uh, I was thinking about whether I was going to have to use one of my dad's guns to take him out or take, use a knife to get rid of him because he was a, he was pretty violent with my mom and it scared me a lot. But um, anyway, that, that he never, uh, you know, they ended, they ended up getting a divorce. And I remember one time when I was probably a little 12 or around that age, asking my mother saying, why don't you get a divorce? You know, and mom mm -hmm. said, we're staying together for you kids. And I was starting to think for myself a lot at that age. And I was thinking, well, you know, don't do us any favors because <laughs> it would be a lot more peaceful around here if you split up. And anyway, they ended up splitting up um, when I was, uh, I was a sophomore in high school. And, and um, dad left the house and my, my dad was the, the disciplinarian in the family. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, later in life, I, I, had, I considered where he had come from, you know, and he grew up, quote, during the Depression. You know, I heard that all our lives. You know, we grew up during the Depression. You should be grateful, blah, 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 blah. And um, but when he was 13 years old, he had been born out of wedlock. I didn't learn most about my dad until after he had died. Mm. He had been born out of wedlock, and um, his mother married mar married a man in a little town in Illinois where, where he came from. And uh, the day that uh, my dad's mother moved into the house with, with George, um, George checked my father out. He was 13 years old. And he said, I'll have no bastard child living in my house. And he kicked my, my dad out. So he was on his own from age 13. Oh, wow. You know, and when he was 18, he went in the, in the Marine Corps. And that was two years before the start of World War II. So uh, he was going to do four years, but then the war started. So they kept him through the end of the war. And he was discharged in Long Beach. And that's where he met my mother. And, you know, the family starts to grow, mm. but, uh, but that was his background. And, and now with all that knowledge that he never told us about when he was alive, I can understand a lot of the anger that he was carrying with him. And, and unfortunately I was carrying quite a bit with myself before I came to that knowledge. 
But um, anyway, when they split up, I remember because my mother was, um, she was a victim a lot, you know, mm -hmm. in her head. You know, she was a, a professional victim, I call them now. And, and she was the 10th born of 11 children. And, and my mother, my dad was an only son, but only child. My mother was from a family with uh, 10 siblings and her, you know, she was the 10th born of 11. It's kind of weird. She had nieces and nephews that were older than her, you know, and I always called them aunt and uncle, my cousins. I just always thought that was weird once they started to get the relationship thing worked out. And um, so anyway, one of her, her niece and her niece's fiance came over to visit my mom. And um, I wasn't 16 yet because I remember I didn't have a driver's license, but um, my cousin Nita came over and her fiance, whose name was Lefty, that was his nickname. I never did know what his real name was. And they ended up being married till he died. And, um, and they came over to commiserate with my mother. Mm. And I don't know where my brother was or my two younger siblings and dad had moved out several months earlier. And um, so they're, they're sitting in a kitchen. We had one of those nooks, you know, with the wraparound booth and stuff. And so there's three adults there and, and me, and I'm 15 going on 16. And, mm. uh, and I'm the kid in the room listening to the grownups talk about all the, what a rotten SOB my father was and stuff like that, which kind of ticking me off a little bit too. But, uh, but Lefty was cool. You know, when he came, he brought a couple of six packs of beer with him. Mm hmm and, and put it in the fridge. And my mother didn't drink, but uh, Lefty and, and Nita both drank beer. You know, they, they, I wouldn't say they were alcoholic. But uh, so Lefty gives Nita beer and, and he gave me a beer. You know, my mother looked at him and she didn't say anything. And he said, you want one? I said, sure. I mean, I'd never drank a beer before. I had a little glass of one once after we mowed the lawn when I was about eight. But uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting there and it was a Bush Bavarian, came in a blue and white can and they had to use a what they used to call the church key sarcastically you know to open a can of beer oh wow <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah he opened it and uh, and i started to drink and i drank it pretty slow but i liked the taste of it mm. and, and i'm just sitting around listening to these grown-ups talk grown-up talk and and i'm taking it all in and uh probably a half hour later uh lefty got up to get into the beer and, and he grabbed a beer and then he looked at me he says is yours empty yet and i said yeah just about and he says well here and he hands me a second beer mm. and, and my mother didn't say anything so i'm listening there's another 30 45 minutes or so and um and they're talking all that stuff i'm learning a lot about grown-ups and um so lefty grabs a, another beer they were going to leave after this one and, uh, and he hands me a, another beer. And my mother looks at him and she says, Lefty, he's only 15 years old. And Lefty said, and I'm going to use the Lord's name here. He said, Jesus Christ, June, it's just a beer. Mm. And my mom said, okay. And she let me drink that third one. Well, somewhere in the middle of that third beer, I hadn't, be, be, I'd never got a buzz. I didn't feel high or anything. But somewhere right in the middle of that third beer, I started to get a feeling inside that was very, very comfortable. You know, I was feeling, as they say today, okay in my own skin. And I didn't spend much time in feeling that way most of my life. And um, I reached what I now call the golden glow, you know, and, and I didn't get drunk. And that was the only three beers I had that night, but I got the golden glow and somewhere in the middle of that, and I know this now in retrospect, looking back that I, I was feeling so good, not, not even realizing it was the alcohol doing it. I was feeling so comfortable. I, I made a very subtle but conscious decision that uh, I think I wanna be slightly inebriated the rest of my life. Mm. And no, I know now looking back, that, that was a conscious decision. It wasn't imposed on me. Nobody ever forced a drink down me. Nobody ever forced a drug down me. I made a decision that I liked that feeling and I wanted to stay there. And uh, and after they left, I didn't see them again for a couple of years. They moved up to the Colorado River. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, 
I had friends. I was, uh, when I got my driver's license, kind of cool. I was working at an ENCO gas station, which in days called Exxon. Mm. And I was 16 years old and I had the uniform, you know, the Exxon uniform, part-time job. And I was six foot three and, and I couldn't grow a mustache yet because I was in high school. They wouldn't allow it back then. Oh, really? and, uh, Yeah. And that's not in the 1960s. But uh, one day I was, I was driving home after work and I pulled in a gas station to get some cigarettes. And I thought, well, I'm going to try to buy a six pack. So I grabbed a six pack of beer and I put it up on the counter and the guy didn't ask me for ID or anything. Hmm. And I realized, well, I can score. I can score, you know, <laughs> right? And, uh, and I thought that was pretty cool. And of course, I told my friends about it. So I became quite popular among people that couldn't score. You know, hey, Coop, let's run down to the store. You can score for us. I said, OK, <laughs> just give me a couple of beers and I'll do it. <laughs> and, and I was starting to drink like that. And, and it wasn't a daily thing, but, you know, every now and again on a weekend. But the further I went, you know, junior year in high school, the summer between my junior and my senior year in high school, we were at a big beach party down in Huntington Beach. And it was uh, mostly just all people from 11th grade. We just got out of 11th grade over at Cal High and Whittier. And we were having a beach party at night. And, and there was a chug -a -lug contest. And I can tell you that, uh, and this wasn't sanctioned by the school, but uh, I was known as Cal High's chug -a -lug champion after that night. <laughs> I don't remember the rest of the night but i remember everybody was proud of me <laughs> oh, and uh, and i was just getting started you know and then um, in my senior year uh, it was around christmas time my mother remarried and uh, and i was my older older brother had gone off to join the marine corps and uh, my two siblings were five and six years younger than i and, and so mom married this man and he was, he was a good man and he was a nice person. And, but I was almost 18 years old and he was a strange man living in my mother's bedroom mm. and they didn't settle it with me, you know? So before I turned 18, I moved out and I got an apartment with a roommate and uh, finished school. I, I dropped out of Cal High my senior year at the midterm and then went to night school and graduated. Mm. But um, I had a girlfriend at that time who was four years older than me. And uh, when Sal and I got our, our apartment up on uh, Washington Avenue in Whittier, uh, the day we moved in, she, she brought over two cases of Budweiser long necks, you know? And that was the housewarming party from, from my girlfriend. So. I was off and running then, you know, I got a full-time job in a factory working in a shop and getting union wages and making money and being able to score, you know. And I was, there was a bar down in Anaheim called The Brook on Brookhurst and, and Ball. Mm. It's called Murphy's now, uh, Jack Murphy. And uh, Jack, he was the owner at the time. But uh, the piano bar player in there, Ray Tatter, was a, a very well-known musician in, in Orange County. And his younger brother, Ray, was a good friend of mine. So we all went down there one night. Nobody ever asked me for an ID. You know, from the time I started drinking, I was never carded anywhere. Wow. I lost this passport. So on my 21st birthday, I'd been going down there because uh, one of my friends was a musician, my roommate. He was a musician and he played drums for the, for the guy that was working with Joe Tatter. And, uh, and I'd go down there and sit around the bar and sing. It was a singing piano bar. And then I drank a lot, you know, and, uh, and my girlfriend and I and a couple other friends went in there uh, on my birthday and were really partying down. And, and Joe, the piano player, says, hey, Coop, uh, you guys seem to be having a party. What's going on? I said, it's my birthday, Joe. And, and uh, Jack, the owner, was standing right behind me. And Joe says, well, how old, how old are you today? And I said, 21. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I thought Jack was going to knock me out of my chair, but he didn't. What could he say? You know, it was too late, right? <laughs> yeah. they, they couldn't bust him or me because I was legal that day. And right. uh, that's just, but that's how my life was going, party time, you know. And uh, and I had uh, been introduced um, to marijuana, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, and I liked that. Smoked a lot of smoked a lot of rope. Mostly, I drank a lot. Uh, dropped acid a couple times. That was not a good trip the second time, so I didn't do it again. 
Mm. So I just, I drank more, you know. And then uh, somewhere along the line, I met a beautiful little girl from Spain and she was going to uh, Cal State Fullerton and um, we ended up getting married. And uh, she didn't drink, but I drank. And, and she knew it was a problem. And and I, I knew it was a problem too, but we talked about it before we ever got married. But in, in, in the uh, 12 years that we were together, the only time we ever had arguments was about my drinking, you know, and we were, we were never, I was never verbally or physically abusive, but mm-hmm. you know, I, sometimes I'd be out all night and not come home till early in the morning and things like that. And that's abusive. You know, at the time I didn't think of it as abusive. I just felt guilty about what I was doing. And, um, there's a, a line in one of the AA books, you know, that, uh, things we tried to do to control and enjoy our drinking. And was, one was swearing off forever with and without a solemn oath. And, and I can tell you that um, I don't know how many times I said, I swear to God, I'll never do that again. <laughs> Great. And the next morning, I would feel so guilty about what I'd done. The only thing I could do to make that guilt feeling go away was go have a few more drinks, you know? And it just, now it was a cycle. And I, I had a sales job in the construction equipment business. And the day I started with this company, the sales manager, who was a personal friend of mine, uh, we had worked together at uh, Pitney Bowes, the company that makes postage machines. And uh, he left that company, got a job as a sales manager at an equipment rental company. And uh, the day they made him a sales manager, the next day he called me up and, and recruited me. So I went to work for him and now... I went to work for a construction equipment company. They give me a company vehicle, pretty cool, and an expense account, you know, after I'd filled out my paperwork to, to, to start there. Um, we go in to see the accountant, and he says, Grace, this is Jim. He's going he's to be working with us. He's a sales rep, and you need to give him his expense money. So they give me $300 cash. Well, this is 1971, 72, mm-hmm. right? In and 300 cash. And I said, what's this? He goes, that's your expense money. He said, uh, you know, you're a salesman. He said, if you're going to go to lunch, you might as well take a customer with you. That's your sales approach. He, he didn't tell me I couldn't drink with that money. You know, he just, <laughs> you know, it's good PR. Take a customer to lunch. You're going to be in a restaurant. I take a customer. So, so I started mm-hmm. doing that. And pretty soon I found some customers that like to have a couple of beers with their, with their lunch. Well, I did too. And uh, started, uh, didn't take too long before I was in, you know, he, he said, oh, we won't want you always to have between two and $300. You know, he said, you might be out with your wife some night at a restaurant and see somebody that's a customer and buy them dinner. So he said, well, we always have a few hundred bucks. So um, he says, when you get down below 200, just turn it, turn the expense checks into to Grace, I think was her name and she'll, just reimburse you to back to 300. So I was using that, you know, using and, and losing and abusing. Mm. And it just became part of my lifestyle. And I remember my wife asking me one time, why do you drink so much? And I said, I have to, it's part of my job, you know. <laughs> and no, and really. that, you know, that was excuses. I was lying to myself, but I was believing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I found out later after I got sober that I had a lot of customers who didn't want to drink at lunch. <laughs> and neither did I. But um, but until I got to that place, it was just getting worse and worse. And um, I had the same proclivities that uh, David had 3,000 years ago. You know? And mm-hmm. I was just... My, my story came right out of um, Proverbs, which of course is... David's son, who must have inherited some of his daddy's, he had a lot of wives, I know that. And anyway, so um, my life was getting worse and worse and worse. And I, and I was, I knew I was guilty. And, and I, I was looking for something. I was always looking for something. I didn't realize that that was God tugging at my heart. And my wife and I would lay in beds on Sunday night. And there was a preacher on there named Ben Hayden. And he had a radio program on Sunday nights called Change Lives. Mm. And this one night, I just something about the way he, he preached 
it wasn't real preachy, you know, it was, it was real, real life stuff. And um, the, the thing that struck me, it was just coming up on Easter and it was uh, when Martha ran out to greet Jesus on his way to Lazarus tomb. And, and he said, you know, he'll, he'll rise up and walk again. She says, yeah, I know on the last day of the resurrection that he'll arise. And Jesus said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Mm -hmm. Whosoever believes in me and lives will never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe. Mm. And it just, um, that resounded with me. It just meant something that I hadn't heard at any church I'd ever gone to or anybody I'd listened to. And, and I don't know, it was just, I thought, you know, I, I need to change my life, but I, I didn't seem to be able to, you know, I thought I could quit drinking anytime I wanted, but I tried to quit and I couldn't quit. Mm -hmm. The ism of alcoholism, you know, we go through all this stuff and not realizing we're addicted. You know, I always thought, yeah, I could quit anytime. I, I had a friend who was a, a pothead, you know, and I said, you know, you really, you're addicted to marijuana, man. And he goes, yeah, well, you're nothing but an alcoholic. And I said, no, I'm not an alcoholic. I could quit anytime I want. I just don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't quit. I tried and tried and tried. But, uh, anyway, my life was getting worse and worse. And, mm -hmm. and I was doing things that husbands shouldn't be doing, you know, and I was a bar drinker and I was chasing women and mm -hmm. I was catching a number of them. And, and feeling guilty about it every time. I never got caught. My, my wife never caught me. She never asked me, you know, she, she would wake up. I'd get up at, you know, like six in the morning to go to work. And she was working nights and I was working days. And that allowed me to stay out later. But, um, she'd wake up in the morning when I would wake up to go to work. And, and she would start asking me, well, where were you last night? You know, who were you with? How much did you drink? And she always asked that. Where were you? Who were you with? How much did you drink? And it's just like I felt like I was being interrogated every morning for, for a few years. And I was, man, this is killing me. And I was I was driven to a point. Well, in, in one of the other fellowships I belong to, it says, you know, we, we're driven to the gates of insanity or death. And and that's where I was driven to. And and on the evening of August 1st, 1978, uh, my wife was at work and I was home alone. And I loaded my gun and I went out on the balcony and I was going to commit suicide. I mean, it was that bad. I was, I was just many, many times I'd wake up in the middle of the night and think, you know, I didn't have the courage to kill myself. But I remember saying, you know, God, I, I don't really believe you're there. But if you are, you know, just take me out tonight in my sleep. Mm. Or just let me go to sleep and never wake up again. I'm good with that. But um, I didn't, I really didn't. I had serious doubts that he was there. And then so that night I went out on the balcony and I, I went out there because you saw how, what a nice guy I am. I remember hearing about uh, Ernest Hemingway, the, the author that he blew his brains out with a shotgun down in Key West, Florida, when I was probably in high school or junior high. And uh, hearing about his, uh, his family when they walked into his place, finding his brains scattered all over the ceiling. And I thought, man, that's rude, you know? So I didn't want my wife to come home and find my brain scattered on the ceiling. So I went on the balcony, <laughs> you know, thinking that my brains wouldn't be on the ceiling. Right. I mean, that's crazy, you know, that's insanity. Yeah. And I went outside and I was getting ready. I loaded the gun and put it in my mouth. And I was thinking, you know, I don't really believe you're there. But if you are, and I was talking out loud, I just want you to know what I think of you. Because I was blaming him for everything bad in my life. You know, why would you, if you're there, let this happen to me? And it's your fault. And and I, I, I damned him in his own name. Mm -hmm. I said, if you're there, if you're really there, prove it to me. Give me a sign 
Andy Sign, strike me dead with lightning right now if you have to, but prove you there. And I said, God damn you for not loving me the way you love those bumper sticker Christians out there. Mm. And that was during the I found it thing, you know, and everybody had the I found it bumper sticker. Mm-hmm. And I was mad at them, you know. I was mad at those people because they mm. found it. They never found it. And I said, just give me a sign, any sign, prove you there. And then I had a blackout. Next thing I know, I wake up in the morning, I'm getting ready for work. I'd forgotten about last night outside on the balcony. And I went and I was shaving, you know, and I'm looking in the mirror and I couldn't stand to look myself in the eye. Mm. And I had, um, this was in August of 78. In the Christmas, seven months earlier, I had given my wife a Bible for a Christmas present that I got at the Berean Bible store over on Orange Thorpe. Mm. And I'll never forget because Christmas Eve day and my wife was working and I was sitting at Charlie Brown's restaurant down in Anaheim on Catellan State College drinking with all my friends. And I looked at my watch and it was 530 and I knew that place was going to close at six o'clock. And I ran out of Charlie Brown's and I drove over to the Berean Bible bookstore and I ran up to the door. It was 10 minutes to six and two guys are working in there. And I, I knocked on the door it was locked. and I said, six o'clock, you know. And, and I'm knocking on the door. They're yelling at me. We're closed. We're closed. It's Christmas Eve. And I yeah. said, I says six o'clock. I bought a Bible. I paid for it already. I got to have it. Mm-hmm. You know, they opened the door and I knew they could tell that I was drunk. You know, I'm, I smelled of it. And yeah. um, so the guy went and he got the Bible and I had her name on Sarat. And I had it inscribed in, uh, in gold leaf on the cover. It was a leather bound. And uh, that was one of her Christmas presents. But anyway, on that next morning, when I woke up, um, I went in the, in the living room and I had an easy chair. That my, my shoes were on the floor in front of the chair. And I sat down to put on my shoes. And I, I looked over on the edge of the piano. We had an upright piano. And it was right next to my easy chair. And she had left her Bible you know, sitting on the edge. Mm that chair of the of the piano and i looked at it and i remember thinking to myself consciously thinking i looked at it and i wondered i wonder if there's really any peace of mind in there i didn't know because i'd never read it Mm. so i picked it up and i opened it at random and i opened it up and i just started reading at the top of the right hand page on the left side and it was Proverbs 23, verse 20. And here's what it says. And it was the King James Version. Like I told you, it's my, my favorite version. A little more poetic. <laughs> so what, this is the first thing I read. It says, be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man in rags. And that got my attention, you know. Yeah. I call them windows, but now I got a new name for them, wine bibbers. Yeah. Yeah. And then I right. get to verse 29, and this is where it tells me my life story that I've been living. You know, the, the guilt, the remorse, the blackouts, the chasing strange women. Mm-hmm. Pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, we call it in, in my other fellowship. And that's where I was, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And then this describes it. And this in the same chapter, verse 29 through the last, last verse it says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath con- wounds, wounds without cause, who hath redness of the eyes. I had all that, you know? Mm. Yeah. Those that tarry long at wine and those that go to seek mixed wine. Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth, moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stings like an adder, which is a poisonous snake. Thine eyes shall behold strange, strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. That one really ticked me off when I got to that one. You know, yeah, exactly. I took that one personal. Right. And it says, Yea, thou shalt be as, be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, 
or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. And then here comes the ism of the alcoholism. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Mm. And I thought that was a sentence. I was just sentenced to doom right then. I will seek it yet again. I knew it was talking about me. And, and, and my anger went to, you know, that particular morning, my wife didn't wake up to ask me those embarrassing questions, but I was getting chewed out by the Bible. That was what I thought. And I, I slammed it closed and I threw it down on the table in her dining room and I walked out and I went to work. And I worked until 1130 that morning and I went to Charlie Brown's. And I know it was 1130 because that's when the doors opened. And I went in and I sat down. I was just going to have two drinks, you know, take the edge off. And I went in, I sat down and I drank till 6.30 that night. So I was drinking for seven hours and I did not get drunk. Wow. You know, during the last, you know, about a year before I got sober, my doctor recognized that I had a Valium deficiency. So, so he gave me, he put me on Valium and I was taking Valium and drinking. So I have almost a year there that was every morning when I'd wake up, I didn't know where I was the night before. You know, I mean, that's, that's how I was living. And, um, those are bad days. So I, I took that as a personal, I just got my sentence from God, you know, I'm going to do it again, but I had forgotten about that. And so I went, I drank for, for, for seven hours and I left there and I was in my pickup truck headed home on state college Boulevard, northbound where the Central Avenue cuts off. And, and, and I'm just feeling devoid of any emotions, feelings. I was an empty shell mm. and and I had, a, I don't know that it was a vision, but I, I saw the letters PROV 2320. And I thought, what's that about? And then I started thinking, wait a minute, you read that this morning. Wait a minute, last night you challenged God to give you a sign. And at that instant, I realized deep down inside where I'd never been before, that it, that was my sign. Mm. Yeah. I just knew there was a God and it was instantaneous and it was powerful. And I had, I haven't had a drink or a drop of uh, alcohol or any illicit drugs from that day until this. And that's 44 years, four months and 10 days. And, uh, and, and God picked me up and dusted me off and sent me to see some people who knew how to get and stay sober. And, um, and, I worked that into my life. Uh, that's a, it's, it's not a religious program. It's not affiliated with any church, but it's a spiritual program and it recommends getting back together with God, you know? And it says the, the main person, purpose of their textbook is to help you find a God of your own understanding that can solve your problem. <clears throat> And, uh, and I was still in the equipment business. I'm driving around and getting in a pickup truck. I'm listening to uh, K Bright, used to be on the radio. And then every morning there was a guy preaching on there. And, and I really liked his style and the way he was talking. And his name was Swindoll. And I thought, mm. this guy is really good. You know? So every morning, four or five days a week, I'm listening to him for half an hour. I kind of blocked out my, my coffee break time for that. And... Uh, I just thought that guy's really good, and I was loving his message. You know, and then one day I didn't realize he was preaching at, at a church just a few miles from where I lived. <laughs> yeah, I was living in Brea or Fullerton, and I was driving down Brea Boulevard, and there's that big UV free church over there. And I saw on the cornerstone out on the on the boulevard there, it said, "You know, Senior Pastor Charles Swindoll." And I thought I've been driving by this church for years and didn't even know there's a guy I'm listening to. So, uh, so I worked up some courage and uh, started going back to church at that church. And, and like I was telling you the other day, that, that, that sanctuary seats over 2,000 people. And, and I hadn't been to a church since I was 15. And that was for, well, other than a couple of weddings, you know. But that's not the same as, as going to church, quote. But um, 
I thought he's right here. And I started going there and, and I walked in and I thought I would feel intimidated by that big of a crowd. And I walked in, I just felt right at home. And, and Pastor Swindoll said three things that first time that I was there that brought me coming back. And like I told you, and, and you chuckled at it. He said, you know, when you come to this church, you don't have to check your brains at the door. God gave you a brain to think with it. It's your responsibility to use it and decipher that what I'm teaching you from here is coming from the word. And that's your responsibility. And I thought, wow. And then, then he told the congregation, he says, now, I, I don't know if they'd had something going on before, but he says, I got to tell you something. He says, this is a large congregation. I mean, they had 10,000 members, you know, and they'd get 2,000 in or three times on a Sunday. Well, actually, the evening service was usually about half of that. But um, he said, there's no one in this congregation that is half human and half angel that was sent here to teach the rest of us how to be good Christians. <laughs> and I thought, man, this guy's got it together. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, and then, then he said, you know, and he was talking about your, our relationship with God. And he said... He said, I don't care if you say praise the Lord a hundred times a day or if you never say praise the Lord. He said, your relationship with God is between you and God. And those were three things I needed to hear that day, I guess, because that kept me coming back, you know, week after week after week for years. And then on my job, I'd been promoted and I was transferred to Northern California. And I came back and I went back over there and he was there a couple more years and then went down and took over the Dallas Seminary. So he went away. I didn't really care for the new pastor. So I just wandered around here and there now and then. But, but um, like we were talking, you know, I mean, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you know, don't, don't you know you not that you are the temple of the living God? And, and yeah, I know that now. Because <laughs> he was talking to more than Nicodemus, I'll tell you. And uh, I just... My life is, is so different from what it was. I ended up with, in a divorce, you know, we were growing in different directions. It was an amicable divorce. There were never any bad words. I had, uh, had listened to a psychologist and paid attention to what she said when she said, well, when you go through that process, just be polite no matter what. And I thought, okay. And now we went through that process and I was always polite, wouldn't fight. She actually got angry at me once. She said, you're not fair. I said, well, and why? She said, you won't fight back. I said, well, you're right. <laughs> I wouldn't fight her. And, uh, but, but today we're on a friendly basis, you know, and uh, every year Christmas time and a birthday phone call or an email. And um, there's still a love and, and a thing there. It's not a romantic love, you know, uh, we wouldn't, be well good together i don't think anymore but that's so long ago now it's just it's history but it's a it's friendly history and it's a loving I, i've learned to love people you know and before you know i mean it's like I've, I've learned since since i got back into believing and, and practicing christianity uh, to the best of my ability i guess that uh, I can love people that I've never even known. And, uh, you know, for the longest time, I thought intimate, intimacy meant sex. And I found out no, intimacy and sex are not the same thing. A lot of people may have, I have that confusion, but, you know, I have intimate relationships with a lot of people. And, and I, can, I can bring lightness into other people's lives. It's complete strangers sometimes. Just a kind word to someone you never saw before. And you can see them kind of light up. And, and it's just, um, I'm, I'm looking for God in everybody, you know, and he's hard to find in some people. And that may be my perception. I don't know. I am kind of judgmental about a lot of people, but, and that's not my job, but, but I still do it well. <laughs> yeah, I like this. I'm going to, this statement that says, it says a, a Christian <clears throat> who wants to live his life as a testimony for Jesus will love God above all else and love others above himself. You know, <clears throat> when I wrote this statement right here, it says a Christian who wants to, to live his life as a testimony for Jesus will love God 
above all else and love others above himself. You know, scripture teaches that we were to put others before ourselves. You know, let nothing be done through self-ambition, the Bible says. But it reminded me of that story that you gave me about that one person that you saw laying in the ground. Tell me about that. Tell the, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a powerful story. Uh, this happened. I was, I was in my first shortly, maybe in the early part of my second year of sobriety. And uh, I'd gotten home from work. And I was getting ready to go to a to meet a friend at the Anaheim Club where we have some meetings. And uh, so we lived on the third floor apartment over on Riverlanda Boulevard. We had carports. And, and I walked downstairs and there's a row of carports on the left and a row on my right. And my, my pickup truck's parked on the right side. So I'm not looking at cars on the left-hand port. And, and I'm walking down, I walk past these cars and I'm heading over to my pickup truck. And there was a, a gentleman, an African-American gentleman standing about three cars further down from my truck. And I get to my pickup truck and he says, hey, did you see that woman over there under the car? And I said, what? And he says, back there by, by where you just came around the corner, there's a woman under that car. And I looked and I could see someone laying under that car. And I said, wow, and I didn't talk to him again. And, and I said, okay. And, and I just started walking over there. And this, this woman was so drunk, she didn't know if she was alive or dead. I reached down and I touched her shoulder. And I said, are you okay? And she opened her eyes and she looks at me and she says, are you a doctor or are you an angel? And she didn't know if she was alive or dead. And, and I said, because <laughs> I was so excited about being sober again. I said, I'm a sober alcoholic and I think I can help you. And she looks at me and she says, BS. <laughs> I said, no, we're going to get you some help. So I get her out from under the truck and I take her upstairs to my apartment. And first thing I did was call the, the Anaheim Club, the guy that I was going to meet for dinner. He and his wife were there waiting for me. And I said, hey, come to my place right away, I have a wet one here and it's a woman, I don't wanna be alone with her. You know, so bring Carol with you, that was his wife. And he brought her over and they came up to my apartment and, and he got on the phone cause he'd been sober a long time and he knew the places to call. And he called and we got her into a detox facility. And then the, the detox was associated with what they used to call a step house, meaning you take the 12 steps. And so she got into a detox and that 12 step house. And, and I didn't, you know, I saw her once after that at a meeting, shortly after she, she was getting out of the step house and she was at a meeting with her husband. And, uh, and I said, hi to her. And then fast forward three more years, I'm having breakfast at Coco's over in Brea there on State College and State and uh, Imperial. And a young lady used to wait on me every day, uh, Victoria, just a, a nice girl. And she used to wait on my friend and me. We worked together. And we walked in this morning and she wasn't there. And I asked Barbara, the other waitress, I said, well, where's Victoria this morning? And she says, oh, Jim, Victoria got in an automobile accident last night and she didn't survive. And I was like, whoa, you know, she's probably 22, 23 college student. And it just, it, my heart sunk. And uh, it, it ruined my whole day, my morning. So I went to a, a meeting at noon, you know, to talk about what's going on. And uh, after the meeting, I went in to, to get a cup of coffee and I was standing there having a cup of coffee and we have sponsors, you know, like the first guy takes you to a meeting and sponsors you. And, and I'm having a cup of coffee and, and my sponsor walks in and he's a devout Catholic. This man used to be at the 630 mass at St. Boniface every day, five days a week, Monday through Friday with Carl Carter. They were best friends. And, uh, but, but he was devout in his religion. Now I'm not Catholic, but I, I respect what he was doing. So he walks in and he says, what's, what's going on? You look like you're upset about something. And I says, I am. He says, what's your problem? And I said, my problem is I'm having trouble understanding God's will today. And John says to me, he says, well, Jim, your job isn't to understand God's will. Your job is to accept God's will. 
And I, I, I thought that was rude. You know, I did at the time. But while we're talking to him, the side door of the club opens and in comes that woman that I pulled out from under that pickup truck. And she sees me and recognizes me and walks over and gives me a big hug. Hi, Jim. How are you doing? I said, Mary, you, you give up lovely, you know. And it was so good to see her sober. Through This is three years later. And she's still going to meetings and, and she gives me a hug and walks out back. And, and John, my sponsor here, looks at me and says, well, who was that? What was that about? And I said, well, you remember a few years ago when I told you I found a woman under a truck and, and teacher Tom and I got her into a step house and everything. I said, that's the woman. And while I'm telling him that story again, I was thinking about that African-American gentleman. Because while I'm walking back there to pick her up, I'm thinking, well, why didn't that guy come over to help her? You know, I didn't realize that was bigotry at the moment. It, re you know, it took me three years to realize that was some racial prejudice on my part. And, uh, and I'm telling John this story. And I said, that's the woman. And so I, I, it occurred to me at that instant that if that African-American gentleman had gone over and tried to get her help, she wouldn't have gotten a detox. She wouldn't have got a recovery home. She wouldn't have been back with her husband. She would have been greeted by police in an ambulance or two. and all kinds of crap. And, and it occurred to me that that was not an accident that that guy didn't go pick her up or try to help her. Maybe he was an angel. I don't know. I've considered that possibility. And maybe his job was to be there to tell me she's over there to see if maybe I would go help. And I did. And uh, that's all conjecture on my part, but it makes good sense to me. And so I then realized one of my character defects was racial prejudice. And, uh, and most of that's gone from my life. Once in a while, there's a tinge of it. But, uh, you know, for the most part, I don't judge people by their color anymore. And, uh, and that was kind of a rude awakening. You know, to realize, oh, my God, I'm one of them, you know. <laughs> I'm one of those. You know, I don't have to remain one. That's the difference, you know. And uh, yeah, Jesus, Jesus just teaches me, you know, love everybody. And I met this little old lady uh, several months ago at a, at a dinner down in Carlsbad. And she's, she's 92 years old and she's been in the AA program for 51 years. And, and they asked her if she had anything to say when, when they gave her a, a little pendant thing where they give us for sobriety and she said yes love everybody until they love you back that's all i have to say <laughs> that, that, that was all she said and i thought i love that line love everybody until they love you back and so I, I try to i try to project that you know to people when i'm out among them and uh, and i try to do good things for people and i just I, i'm a lot lot different you know i had in early sobriety, I went to see a couple of people I had worked with a couple of years before, and and two of them. I walked into my, my buddy's office and he looks up at me. We hadn't seen each other in two years. And he goes, "My God, Cooper, what happened to you?" I said, "What do you mean?" He says, "You look great." Yeah, I, I physically I had changed and didn't even realize that. You know, my countenance had changed. He said, no, you're glowing, man. He said, I don't know what you did, but, you know, it's great. And then uh, there was another, was a woman worked at the same company, and I, I went to her office to see her. And she said the same thing. Oh, you look great. What's going on? What happened? And I said, well, Marge, I, I quit drinking, <laughs> you know. And, um, and, I, and I, I've got God working in my life now. Life is good. Even through the hard times, you know, as, as Paul said, I've learned to be content regardless of my situation. And I've come in contact and made friends with people like you. And, you know, that was a, another one of my buddies, Plumber John, that introduced me to you. And because um, I'd asked him if he knew an honest mechanic, and those are hard to find. So I wasn't sure, but the first time I used you, you proved you were. And I've been back ever since, and we've shared stories with each other. And, and there's, there's a kinship.
that I wouldn't have with the guy down at the local shop, you know, I think. <laughs> and uh, I, I always feel spiritually lifted after talking to you. And, uh, and that's, that's a blessing for me. And the things you do, I mean, like what you did down there on, on the corner of beach and could tell or whatever it was. I mean, yeah, I want to see film of that. <laughs> yeah, one of the brothers is, is going to film it because uh, he interviewed it, interviewed some of the people that we came in contact with. Uh, so, so anyway, that that's pretty much that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. It hasn't changed in a long time now. And uh, you know, I wake up uh, every morning. I have as a book called Jesus Calling. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. And it's a daily devotional. And I read that. And uh, and I read some from the Bible. And then I get like three close friends that send me like daily devotionals every day. And all three of them are different. But uh, it all comes back to, to God and my relationship with him. <clears throat> and them. So... <coughs> Some day starts every day, excuse me. Yeah, amen. I like that. <clears throat> I like that because, um, you know, what you reminded me right now, because, think, you know, when you told me that story about, you know, about that woman that was under the car, you know, sleeping under a car, I mean, think about it. If the guy would have got, got in his truck or whatever, the car, it was a truck, he got in his car. Took off. Could you imagine? I, I was driving a pickup truck. I think that was a sedan. Yeah, it was pretty low to the ground. I mean, think about it. That guy would have gotten yeah, the driver would have got in on the other side and wouldn't have seen her. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. when you told a story, that, I, mean, I hadn't. I hadn't even considered that angle. <laughs> I just considered that you know, I was the person that had the disease that she needed to, to get help with. And I was, it was now looking back, it's like I was sent there, you know. And at the time, it was just like, I don't know, just something I had to do at the moment. <laughs> yeah, because you couldn't, you could have said, well, you know, shine this dude on, you know, you take care yeah. of her. You know? Yeah, tell the guy, yeah, call 911, I'm busy. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I got, I, I got, you know, <laughs> that's not my business. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm a but spiritual giant. Don't have time to take care of her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, think about it. You you have a heart when you know when the Lord comes into your life and speaks to you, especially the way He spoke to you. You know, when He took you to Proverbs twenty three, and it has to do with alcohol. Yeah. And has to has to do with the, you know the life that you're living. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, if that well, all Lord, my friends, huh? All my all my friends are so different. Oh, you're right now than they were before, you know. Yeah. Are we still connected. Yeah, you froze a little bit, but you're okay. back. Okay. You, you, my friend Dave. He had a pickup truck. He wanted some help with. Now, Dave's the kind of guy. One day we were meeting for coffee over at the the Black Bear Diner in La Habra, mm -hmm. and he and his wife lived just a couple blocks from there, and uh, and we're we're headed in. There's a bus bus stop out front. And, uh, and he says, go ahead and get a table. I'll be in a minute. I said, what are you going to do? And he says, I'm going to go talk to that lady sitting over there. And there was a little old lady sitting there waiting for a bus all by herself. And she was probably in her 70s at the time. And this is like 15 years ago. And now I'm in my 70s. But, but he could tell she was lonely and needed someone to talk to. So he just went over and talked to her for a few minutes, you know. And, and he, he does that with people, you know. And, and he's, you know. You have a relationship with Jesus, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's how he starts. And that's what she needed. I said, did she feel better when you left? He goes, yeah. You know? But that's the kind of guy he is. Mm. And you look at him, he's a big, dumb bus driver, you know. <laughs> Except now he's retired. Mm. But most of my friends, I have a lot of friends like that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a heart of compassion. So, I mean, who, who can, sometimes yeah. before I got used to it, it would embarrass me, you know, if 
somebody stops, I'm with a guy and, and we're going someplace and, and they stop to talk to somebody. And the first thing they ask is, you know, have you thought about making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? And I'm thinking, oh, don't embarrass me, you know, in public. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. And now it's commonplace. Right. You know, yeah, I like that. <clears throat> Uh, because you know it's it's the Lord that works in and through our lives. Yeah. I had a friend years and years ago before I got sober. His name was Ron Hayford. He was the chaplain over at Biola. Mm. Yeah, and I didn't know that, but I used to see him at this Fiddler Three coffee shop that I went every morning for coffee before work. And he walks in one morning. I have a hangover. I say, "Hey, Ron, how you doing?" He says, "Pretty good, Jim. How you doing?" I say, ah, "Not a very good morning." And he said, "Jim." Have you have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior yet? <laughs> and this is before I got sober. I wasn't ready for that first day. I'm having a cup of coffee, Ron. I mean, that's what I told him. You know, I, don't, I can't talk about that right here in public. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> he embarrassed me. And, but we became good friends. You know, so he saw me. He was able to see me get sober and, and progress through that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't know. Life is so good. It's just it's so good. Amen. And yeah. Praise <clears throat> God. And you know, like when I was having the hard things and the guys over at the community chapel, they put their, they laid their hands on my chest and prayed for Jesus to heal my heart. And he did. I mean, I got a medical approval on my heart. The cardiologist, Jim, I don't know how it happened. Your heart's normal again. Oh, well, I know how it happened, but he didn't want to hear it. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah, the doctors think that they heal people. They don't. Doc <laughs> doctors treat us, and God heals us. Amen. So, yeah. Amen. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. yeah well, many because many doctors they you know they trust in their medicine. Take this, you know. Take that. You know, but you know, I like that. I mean, that's a testimony in its own right there. They laid hands on you, and they healed you, right? The power of God. And it's and it's this is is um with the testimony yeah. Christ done a work in your life. Then tell so tell someone it may be just exactly you what have they trouble do. hearing it again. Okay. There you, go. okay. you ready? Are you back? It's okay. frozen on me here. I don't know if you hear me. See nothing. Oh, there. You yeah, you there. Yeah, we lost our connection there for a minute. I'm here now. Hey, Randy. Is yeah, we haven't not, met, but I'll know you when I see you. Oh. Oh, yeah, big Randy? Oh, yeah, he's he's got yeah, a hard time. We lost connection there for a minute. Mm -hmm. I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear? Can you hear me? Now you're breaking up real bad. How about now? I don't know if it's my phone or the connection. Oh, good. You got to plug in. Make sure it doesn't it doesn't uh, lose its. I charge. can hear you. I wasn't hearing. Plug your yeah, phone. Yeah, I'm in. plugged in. It's connected now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we were kind of finished anyway, huh? Yeah. The um. This is the statement that says, here's a statement that says, has Christ done a work in your life? <clears throat> then tell someone it may, it may be just exactly what they need to hear to give them faith that God can work in their life too. God wants you to, God wants you and me to partner with him in the work that he is doing. <clears throat> you know, God wants us to partner with him. God wants us to partner with him in the work that he is doing, you know, in your life, yeah. in my life, in Big Randy's life. But it's like this. It says, has Christ done a work in your life? Then tell someone. It may be exactly what they need to hear. You know, sometimes we do yeah. have to hear our testimony. And, and, and right? it's, it's nice when, when you're doing it consciously, you know. And you know, most of all is let your life be let your life be your Christian testimony. 
<laughs> yeah. Right? Let, let yeah, your life yeah. be your, your Christian testimony. Yeah, don't don't say it to me, show me. <laughs> right? <laughs> um yeah. But no, I you know, I like that um and I really like your testimony, uh, the gym, and I, I wanted to record it to make sure I have it, have it, <clears throat> you know, like I said, you know, I mean, the enemy didn't want you to have it, didn't want us to have it here. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, COVID, COVID got in the way, but we got out, we beat it. <clears throat> right, right, and you were really sick, and I, and I know that the Lord has been, I was praying for you, praying for you for this day that it would come to pass. Yeah. You know, like I was telling my wife, I go, I need to put Jim, I want to have Jim's testimony because his, his, his testimony is very powerful. You know, some people don't believe that. They don't believe that God can do something like that. I mean, just the way, but the way he spoke to you, you know, I mean, he spoke to me in, in a similar way also. Um, the way I came to the Lord, you know. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you, your wife said it to you verbally. And and my wife left her Bible sitting on the on the piano. Now I don't know if she left that for me to see, but that's where she left it. And she was the one to put it there. I didn't. <laughs> so I know, but think about it. I and mean, that was what, the what motivated you to pick it up? You know, like you said, you know, let me see if let me see if this is if if, if there's any truth in here. Yeah, well, I asked him to prove it, prove he was there the night before, and he heard me. I think what he heard was, please help, you know. There's yeah. two words that he understands, please help. So, I mean, that's 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 really good. I really, really like that, that testimony. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, I want to thank you for that. You want, you want anything, you have anything to share, Big Randy? Want to know what? Uh, Big Randy? <clears throat> hey, hey, Jim. James. Yes. Um, listening to your testimony, is, it was really uplifting and awesome. And I can apply it to my life even more. But, you know, I, after thinking about how you became and became a Christian and came to know the Lord, I honestly feel in my heart that all are called, but there's only few that are chosen to go forward and speak to those certain people. And God's not finished with you yet. You know, because no. <laughs> if, if he was, you would be in heaven celebrating with him. So same as me. Same as me, same as Junior. God's not finished with us yet, you know. We're no. we're all we're all still we're all still going to school. We're all still trying to learn, and God is still showing us who He wants us to talk to, who He wants us to go to. And listening to you, you you bumped into so many people that you have made friends that not only do you have their back, but they got your back, you know, and having that encouragement is what brings me to be able to listen to your testimony right now. Cause I bumped into junior and if I never bumped into junior, I would never have known you. And yeah, because of that little encouragement that you're giving me on how to approach a situation, now I can go out and tell somebody else about it. I can go out and reach out to someone else now. And, you know, what comes around goes around in the Christian neighborhood, you know? Yeah. And I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you've given me today. And I'm going to go. I I'll tell you the truth. I'm in a hotel in Visalia right now. And 
I'm going to go to back to work tomorrow and I'm going to drive back to Orange County, but you know, I'm, I'm going to, um, right now, right this very second, before I came into this testimony, I've been talking to my own boss about the Lord up in my room because I, yeah. I get to be with him tonight, you know? Yeah. And, and he has a son. He's six, six years old and he can't talk and he's got something wrong. Well, before I came down here to listen to your testimony, I was telling him that no weapon formed against him is going to prosper. No weapon formed against his son that's keeping him from talking is going to prosper only because I get to be in this room with you. I get to tell you what God says about that. And I got to read, you know, uh, a little Romans, a little Revelations, you know, and I almost led him to the Lord just before I came down here to listen to your testimony. So I already know God's in the mix on, on this whole trip that I've taken to Visalia here. And, and, and you're part of that deal. You know, we all, we all have a piece of that pie. Yeah. And God's using you to help me to go back up there to that room and finish the job. You know what I mean? But I'm, very encouraged because I can't stop now. I got to keep pressing on. I got to keep going. I can't stop now. Yeah. I got to keep going because I know God is working all things together for the good. And okay. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy I met you. Me, me too. In real life. Tell your boss I'm going to add his, him and his son to my prayer list too. For sure. And and Jim, I want to James. I want to ask you, what high school did you say you went to in Whittier? California High School in Whittier. My my father in law went to Sierra. Yeah. My grandmother on his mom. She went to Whittier, and her oh, name was. Okay. She lived in Whittier. Her name was Haggerty. Do you remember her? No. Pat. Pat. Haggerty, and they Haggerty. owned they owned Haggerty salsas, Haggerty uh, chili sauces. Oh, okay. And they lived in Whittier. Yeah, I always like to know, you know, if you lived in Whittier or not, because I like to mention these names. But yeah, my grandmother on my wife's side, her dad's mom was Haggerty, but. I know you know Sierra High School. Yeah, two of my closest friends went to Sierra. They were two years ahead of me. I was the class of 1966, and then my two buddies were the class of 64 from Sierra. That's right. Yeah, and then I had I had a few other friends that went to St. Paul. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, St. Paul always had a good football team. Cal I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, but it was good meeting you, man. I hope My I meet you in real life soon. Okay. We'll do that. We'll get together. Yeah, hey, Junior. Mm. Thank you. This was a blessing. I mean, I'm not trying to end nothing off, but I think my phone's about ready to die, and I'm downstairs. I'm not upstairs yeah. where my charger's at, so. Okay. <laughs> All right, Everything just turned black on me right now. I can barely see you guys. <laughs> well, well okay. I, I'm hearing everything you're saying, but your lips don't move in conjunction with the words. So <laughs> something wrong either. with the connection. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Junior, I love you, man. Okay, buddy. Gracias. Randy, thanks. A pleasure. Bless you, my friend. God bless you. Yeah, he's gonna break up. He's gonna break up. The um I'll see you someday. Yeah, that that's American Sign Language for I love you. Did you know that?
Oh, is it? <clears throat> yeah, that that sign. Uh huh. In American Sign Language for Deaf People. Yeah. That has the letter I, L, and Y, and they put it all together and it spells "I love you." Oh, okay. So that's how deaf people, when deaf people do that, they're saying "I love you." Hmm. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah, me too. You know, once again, it says a testimony. A testimony is how a person encountered the God of the Bible. You know, and you and you you made it. You said that the uh, when you opened up the Bible, it led you to Proverbs twenty twenty. Wait, when it says, "Do not mix, do not mix with wine bibbers, or with glutton, gluttonous eaters of meat." Verse twenty one for for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. Right. I mean, I mean, that's powerful right there. You know, once again, a testimony is, is how a person encountered the God of the Bible. The testimony, the testimony of, of how Christ came into my life and made me a different person. You know, and that's what you shared tonight. Yeah. And, and I dig that. I'm a different person completely. I mean, because, I mean, <laughs> I mean, God's the only one who can do that change. Yeah. Give us a heart of compassion and to love others. Right? What's the golden rule? <clears throat> the, the golden rule is to, to do yeah. unto us as you do would unto others. have done unto you. Them do unto you. I mean, I mean, we can only think that when we're sober. <laughs> that was... That, that was also in, in Leviticus, I think. Mm. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For Deuteronomy, when, whenever Jesus said, you know, it is written, he was quoting from Deuteronomy. So. Right. Yeah. I, could, I couldn't have told you any of that 40 years ago. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that part where you said to your parents were Methodists. <clears throat> and you know, at four years old, you're baptized, huh? Yeah. And then, um, but yeah, well, yeah, you took a drink at a small, at a young age, also. <laughs> took a what? I took a drink at the young at a young age. Yeah. But um, and then you took another drink at you were fifteen. Yeah. But I'm surprised you didn't get buzzed with three beers. I would have got a buzz with three beers. <laughs> the, the first one I had, I can tell you, was it was a hot summer day. And my dad had my older brother and me. Now, John was only two years older than me. And, uh, and we mowed the back lawn. It was a big yard. And it took two of us to push the lawnmower. But when all the yard work was done, my, my dad says, okay, uh, go out on the, on the back porch. I'll be out there in a minute. And he comes out. And he brought, you know, a little bitty, like maybe two ounces of a beer in a very small glass. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember I'm on the back porch, you know, overlooking our kingdom, the backyard. And, right. and, and the work we just did, you know, feeling like a grown up man. And I remember I'm drinking this beer and he put salt in it because he says you sweat, you know, you got to have salt. So he put salt in the beer. And, uh, and I'm drinking a beer with my, my older my older brother and my dad on the back porch overlooking the, the ranch, so to speak. And, uh, and I remember, I didn't know what the feeling was, but looking back, the feeling I had at that moment was, wow, this is what it's like to be a man. You know, I identified having that drink with manhood. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I mean, my dad taught me three things, right? Drink hard. Uh, no, work hard, drink hard, and pretty much sleep with whoever you want. Just don't get caught, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, but yeah. that, was, that was a machismo time. And, you know, when my dad, possibly your dad too, when they were growing up. Yeah. I mean, thing, if you didn't drink, you weren't a man. My, my first sexual experience with somebody other than myself. My father took me to a brothel in Nevada. 
when I was 15. Mm. Shortly, about a month after my birthday. And uh, that was my first sexual experience with a woman. Right. And that's, I mean, to, to him, that was part of the, the rite of passage, I guess, you know? Yeah, I mean, they, you know, but the, I mean, when I came to Christ, I'm like, man, what my dad taught me in a sense, you know, but that's his way of being, you know, a yeah, man. No. You know, like you're saying, a man. I never, I never regretted it, but I, w- I wouldn't do that to my own son. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> well, no, because you you got biblical sense now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, what does it talk about? It talks about the woman, even right here in Proverbs twenty-two. <clears throat> it talks about the woman, right? I mean, you're seeing. If, if you keep reading beyond the the first two verses I read, yeah, it talks about uh, women and and prostitutes, the whole thing. Hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I, I really like it because you know you ask God to reveal it, to reveal Himself to you, and He revealed it. He revealed Himself to you in the Word, and it couldn't give you a better chapter than Proverbs twenty three right here. Yeah, I mean, I'm right there. Um, but we'll end with uh, Romans one sixteen says, "For I am not ashamed." That's what they reminded me of your of your friend that uh, will walk up to people and you're walking with them. And then he would go and share Christ with somebody else. Like, yeah. you know, invite them to, to receive Christ. Uh, Romans one Romans one sixteen says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God into salvation for what, everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. You know, I like that. And verse 17 says for in the, for in it, the righteous, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Yeah. You know, you know, it, it, it's funny because when, when I meet people and it turns out they're Christian, number one, it doesn't surprise me anymore, but that's how Dave and I met, you know, I was going, going to uh, Starbucks over there on Whittier Boulevard and beach Boulevard. And I would go there in the afternoon after most of my work was done and just sit outside and have a cup of coffee. And I wasn't really socializing with anybody, but here was this big weird guy walking around talking to everybody. And it was Dave. And uh, I was sitting talking to another, an old guy. I was probably 20 years older than me. And, uh, and Dave came over and sat down at the table and just started talking. He knew the other guy and introduced himself to me and, you know, it turns out he's a brother in the Lord, and uh, I've gone to his church a few times, and we talk about life, you know, in relationship with with God, and uh, how are we dealing with it? And, you know, that's uh, I don't know if you if you had told me twenty years ago I'd be doing that, I wouldn't I wouldn't have known. But you know, right. that just wasn't who I was then. But I'm I'm totally different now. Amen. <laughs> and I thank God for your life. Oh, I think I thank God for those, your life. Those are the kind of people I meet now, yeah. Right. I meet some nasty people too, but I just don't hang around with them. <laughs> oh yeah, because hopefully I've changed some. Yeah. The, what does the Bible say? It says bad had, or good morals. <laughs> well, you, you never know when you're affecting somebody. And and and, and we have these panels in AA and, and we'll take five or six people and then we'll go to a recovery hospital and, and the panel will share. Each person will tell a little bit of their story, you know, about what we used to be like and what happened and what we're like now. And I told, the guy called me, he was a friend of mine, Walt McGonagall, he's dead now. He was a lawyer, but he was a, a pretty good buddy of mine. So he called me up one day and he says, Hey, Coop, there's a, there's a recovery unit in a hospital over on the corner of Idaho and Lambert. He says, you live pretty close to there, don't you? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, I have a panel going in there next Tuesday evening, uh, 7 o'clock. Can you join me? And I said, I said, well, you know, I said, those panels, you know, they're a waste of time. We go in and we tell our stories and, and we're sitting here with a bunch of people, half of them are half loaded from their meds, 
you know, and they're drooling while we're listening to us and stuff. I said, yeah, it's a waste of time. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know all that crap. He says, but are you going to go? And I said, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> so, so I go, I go to that meeting and it had to be a year or two later, you know, I stopped by uh, to get a cup of coffee at the, the club in Anaheim where they have meetings and I was going between sales calls and I went in to get a cup of coffee and I'm standing there talking to somebody and there was a young guy sitting on the couch over in the, in the lounge area and he looks at me and then I'm, I'm talking to my friend and he gets up from the couch and walks over. He says, excuse me. He said, is your name Jim? And I said, yeah what's your name? And he told me, and I said, Oh yeah, what's up? He says, well, he said, were you at a, at a panel that came into the, whatever hospital it was over there on Lambert in Anna, in La Habra at Idaho and Lambert. And I said, yeah, I remember that. And he goes, I just want to thank you. He said, you said something when you were talking that's helped me be sober for two years now. And I had no idea I touched somebody's life. But I had, and I didn't even want to go to the meeting. And Walt said, "I don't care. You're going anyway." <laughs> and so we help people sometimes when we don't know it. But it's good to get that kind of feedback once in a while, you know. But when somebody walks up and says, "Yeah, you said something a couple of years ago, and I haven't forgotten it," I was like, "Wow, I didn't. I don't remember saying that." <laughs> yeah, because it's it's God working. You know, the Bible says in Philippians 1, 6, I believe it says, he who has begun a good work uh, will continue to work in, in you until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who has yeah. begun a good work in you, you will finish it until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's God working in and through our lives. You know, we impact people just yeah. by sharing faith. You know, we never know who's listening. Well, right? it, it's, it's kind of my experience. The first time I met Chuck Swindoll, you know, as a, as a member of the congregation, because he would always stand up there and greet people after, after the services were over. And I went up and introduced myself. And at the time I was sober five years, I think, when I went up and met him. And uh, so I said, hi, I'm Jim. And he says, it's a pleasure to meet you, Jim. And he says, uh, how are you doing? I said, pretty good. And he says, uh, he said, really? And I said, yeah. He says, well, you know, most people that show up here uh, on a scale of one to 10 are usually around, around three or four before they come here. And he says, well, where would you be? I said, seven or eight. And he goes, that's pretty high. And I said, yeah, well, I said, I wasn't just born again. I was resurrected. <laughs> <laughs> five years ago i was a hopeless helpless alcoholic and i've been clean and sober ever since and been coming here for every year or whatever it was and, and, and i just love it and i love your church and, and he said well god bless you you know and that that was fun it's funny because i don't know if if drug addicts do but once in a while i might have a dream about i'm drinking and one time i had a dream and it was about after i quit smoking and i was at um there was a, a coffee shop like, like all the coffee, Starbucks and all those today. And it was on Imperial over in Brea. And I think it was called Seattle's Best or something like that. And in my dream, I was having a cup of coffee and smoking a cigarette with Pastor Sundahl. And he was smoking too. And we were both trying to hide it from people. <laughs> and that's in my dream. And that's a weird dream, you know I mean? Where does that stuff come from? <laughs> and that's weird to fit the pastor into my, my dream where I was smoking up and I wasn't drinking or smoking or anything at that point. I just <laughs> thought it was funny to have a dream like that. Yeah, that's funny. That is funny. I like that. I wasn't, what did you say? I wasn't born, I was resurrected? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't just, I said, I wasn't just born again. I was resurrected. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> That goes above and beyond <laughs> the born again, right? <laughs> yep. I love it. I love it. Um, well, I'm, glad not, you, I'm glad you convinced me to do this. No, I really like it. I, 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 
I'm like I said, I love your testimony, and I love you know what God's going to do with this. Um, like I said, because there's other people that need to hear this. Um, I mean, a lot of times I share my testimony, like is in, in our Bible studies and so on. Um, but um, it's good to hear someone else's testimony, you know, especially yours, you know, you know where, where you've been and you know where you at today and what God is doing in your life today. You know, you want to share what's God, what God is doing in your life today? Apart from what you already shared? <clears throat> well, pretty much, you know, I mean, I'm spending time with people that need my company, I guess. It's, that's all. Because sometimes I wonder, you know, what's my purpose? But, and then somebody else told me, oh, that'd be your purpose is just to be sharing you with other people. So if that's what it is, that's what it is. I'll accept that. You know, because I think of Proverbs eighteen sixteen. Proverbs eighteen sixteen says a man's a man's gift makes room for him, and brings him before great men. You know what does that mean? That means that that that, that, that means that the, that the gift and the calling that God has in your in your life will announce itself. Yeah. You know, I think it's announced itself here in this in this testimony setting. Yeah, you know. In AA, one of the sayings is, "You, we've got to give it away in order to keep it." Hmm. You know, it's like, like I don't know if you remember, a guy had a a talk show on Cape Right. His name was Rich Bueller, and and the name of his 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 talk program he was on for an hour every day was a uh, talk from the heart. And he was a big, I met him in person once. He was big, very obese. And, uh, but he said, you know, when they were feeding 5,000 people with a few fish and a few loaves, he said, as long as they were giving the fish away, they kept multiplying. As soon as they stopped, they stopped. Yeah. <laughs> you got to give it away in order to keep it. And it's, it's hard to, to visualize the abundance that's available for us sometimes, you know, especially in tough times economically and things like that. But uh, yeah, I, sometimes I have to look for that stuff pretty hard. It's easy for me to get depressed. Well, you know, the, the, uh, there's a statement that says um, the frozen chosen, you know, because we're, we're, we're called to give our testimony. We're called to be that light. Um, he said, uh, what a great glory said this. He says, he says, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what he, the way he said it. But either, you know, he's, he's talking about either evangelize or fossilize. <laughs> evangelize or fossilize, you know, and we know that God has chosen chosen us to 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 share our testimony um we're chosen to share you know the you know the way you know the way i encouraged uh the people that are outreach <clears throat> you know the people that were out there in the street and have no place to stay you know i went under the bridges and carried my cross and invited them to come to our outreach that we're gonna you know share some love on them and uh i'd say about 75 percent of the people received the prayer uh, received, uh, you know, for me to share my faith with them, but I told them this really encouraging scripture. It's in it's in Jeremiah one five, which kind of like, I mean, it just brought them and it stunned them. Yeah, and I, I gave him Jeremiah chapter one verse five that says, "Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I sanctified you." And I go, you know what that means? I go, what was your name again? He goes, Tom. I go, Tom. You and me, you know, I, I didn't choose to exist. And, and I go, I'm sure you didn't choose to exist. Did you choose to exist? He goes, no. <laughs> well, I didn't either. I, I didn't choose to be born, you know, but God chose, uh -huh. you, chose me to be in this earth, to be alive. I mean, to be here on, we're, we're standing on this earth for a purpose think about it you know god chose you he, you know god thought about you even before you were in your mother's belly 
Jeremiah yeah. says, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. How did God know me before I even I was in my mom's belly? I knew you, know, you before the foundations of the earth. I mean, that's be, in there somewhere too. Yeah. Yeah, he says before you were in your before your mom even thought about having you having having Tom or having Junior, God was already thinking about you. Yeah. Was it amazing that God would think about you and think about <clears throat> me? Why? Why would God choose a person like me? <laughs> I know. Huh? <laughs> you know, but I yeah, gave him, you know. Yesterday, and and I was I was surfing the, I was surfing the TV, and I was at I don't I don't watch TBN very much because some of the people they have on there I think are more money oriented than they are God oriented, but that's just me being judgmental. So I was on the way to here on Spectrum in Whittier, the uh, TBN's on channel seven one two. So I'm scrolling up from channel five, four, where I'd been watching the Sunday night, the Monday, Sunday night football game. And, uh, and, and I stopped because David Jeremiah, speaking of Jeremiah, uh, was, was preaching and he was at a big place in New York city. It's come, it's a Christmas ceremony. And he was talking about just what, just what you were talking about, you know, you know, bring bring your stuff he talked about a woman in in brazil whose daughter left home and she went to the big city and she knew her daughter was too young and wouldn't be able to probably end up being a hooker and she said she was gone a long time and she was a poor woman and she went to the city and saved up all her money and she stopped at a drugstore and took took a hundred pictures of herself you know the machines that you could go in back in the day and uh and on the back of each one she wrote a note and then she started going around to hotels and bars and going in the restrooms and the bars and putting her picture on a mirror thinking her daughter will see the picture and read the message on the back and as it was over a year later her daughter was coming downstairs from a hotel where she just worked a trick i guess and saw her mother's picture on a bulletin board and came over and read it and it said i don't care what you've done i don't care who you've been with i don't care how long it's been you know none of that matters to me we i love you come home and he said that's what god's trying to do with us you know i don't care what you did i've forgiven it come home and that's because I did a lot that I needed forgiveness for, you know, and I'm aware, way aware. Uh, my wife doesn't know my ex-wife. I was the only wife I ever had, so I still call her my wife. But mm -hmm. Yeah, she never asked me and I never got caught. And I'm glad she didn't. Because there was no point. Hey, when we do our, uh, our ninth step in AA, it's making amends to people. Mm hmm well, I made amends to her, but I never mentioned any of that that I knew would hurt her. Because we say there, you know, we make amends to people except when they do so would injure them or others. So I got to save her by not telling her because I've confessed my sins to other people, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would just help her if I'd have told her that stuff. So as far as I know, she's never heard any of my uh, AA talks when I talk about that or because I've done that now for years. I love speaking in public, but I'm always nervous before I do it. <laughs> I'm glad I came over this morning. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the, um, you know, in Christ, <clears throat> in, in Christ, and this is what I was preaching to, what I was preaching at the corner this, this Saturday, but, and, it, and it's great, you know, because, you know, in Christ, you, ha you have no, you have no past, only a great future, right? And, I, thought, I never heard yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. In Christ, you have you have no past, only a great future. Because because Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you are of peace and not of evil, to give you what? To give a future and a hope. Yeah. You know, and God forgives your sins, you know, as the sands of the sea, 
as far as the east is from the west, I have forgot. I have forgiven your sins. I've forgotten your sins. Yeah, forgot. Yeah. So, so why why bring it up if God has already forgotten your past? You see, that's why yeah. in Christ you have no past, only a great future. And that's what I was preaching this 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 Saturday at the corners. You know, when we're doing our outreach, you know, go. There's many of you that are struggling with your past. You know, you're cheating on your wife. You're going to bars. You're going places where you shouldn't, you know? I go, so don't cheat on your wife. Don't cheat on your husband. You know, you don't have to drink yourself to sleep. You don't have to take the next hit. I go, you can come to church and be set free, you know, come to come to Christ yeah. and be set free, you know? Because 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, I like to say in the church too, because when I first came to Christ, I had that I had that issue too. I would not come out and speak. I would not go to prayer meeting. I mean, first of all, I didn't know how to pray, but you know, but I wouldn't fellowship because the word of God convicted me of my past. And I'm like, dude, there's no way, you know. I go, but you know, when I heard that, you know, that um that and when I when I heard that first John 1 9 that says that we confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know, all I had to do was confess it. So when the moment that you ask God to forgive you, then you go ahead and do the same thing and forgive yourself. You see, there's a lot of people in the church that have not forgiven themselves. Yeah. For, for what they did, they're shamed. They're, they're ashamed. I, I was ashamed. I'm ashamed of what I did, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But I learned to forgive myself. Once I learned to forgive myself, myself, then I was able to go on with my life. You know, I wouldn't have this Bible study. I wouldn't be out there preaching. I wouldn't be out there teaching. I wouldn't be talking to people about God if I didn't learn to forgive myself. You know, when we say, when we say, you know, first John 1 9 says, when you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I mean, what part of that don't we understand? Yeah. The, we confess it. God forgives you. He forgives you of your past, your present and your future sins. Yeah. And he's forgotten your past. You don't have to go back to that. That's the marvelous thing about the gospel is that you don't have to go back to that. God's forgiven you about it. You know, all God has for you is a great, all you have is a great future. You know, and there's another thing too, is that, you know, what, what's one way to get rid of my past? Well, you make a future out of it. Well, how do I make a future out of it? Well, you give your testimony <laughs> of how God delivered you and how God set you free. Yeah. And I think that's what we heard tonight. You know, we heard how God set you free, you know, how God delivered you, you know, from your past. Sure does, huh? And, and that's a great testimony. I mean, your testimony speaks volume because you, you know, you spoke about how God spoke to you. You guys got to reveal it, reveal himself to you. And he took you right to scripture. And that scripture, you know, it made an impact in your life. A yeah. great impact in your life. Um, well, when, when, when I read that Proverbs that day, I had never read the Bible, really, you know, and I'm looking back and I'm thinking, you know, I went through confirmation class at a, at a large organization church, the Methodist church at that time was the largest Protestant church in the country, but we didn't spend much time in the Bible or, or if we did, I don't remember it. I was in sixth grade. You know, but you know, the that to open to that page and have my own story told to me right there. And I thought I was doomed. Yeah. Instead of being about to be forgiven. <laughs> yeah. I had, I had no idea my life was about to do a 180. But I really think that, you know, you know, uh, I mean, you know, once again, you know, we go to Proverbs 18, 16 says a man's gift makes room for him. And brings him before great men, you know, you know the calling and the gift that God has has in your life will announce itself. And like I said, it's it, you know, and and what's what's the what's the what's the gift and the calling that God has in my life? Well, it's whatever God has you doing today. You know what 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 the how do I know the calling that God has in my life? Well, what's what's God doing in your, in my life today? You know. That's how you know what, what the gift of God is, is it, and the calling that God has in your life is because what comes, what comes 
what's easy for you and what comes naturally to you. You know, your testimony and the way you share your faith and where you've came from. That right there comes naturally to you because it's it's in you and it just comes out of you normally. You don't have to struggle with it. Yeah. It just because you lived it. You know, and, and you're able to touch a lot of people's lives. You know, and that's your gift and that's the calling that God has in your life. It, it's announcing itself. Yeah. You know, because it impacts, it makes a great impact. Yeah. And, and I thank you for sharing that. I really, really thank you for sharing that. You're you know, welcome. Many, many listeners are going to be, you know, blessed by this, by your testimony, Jim. Yeah. How many listeners do you have or do you know? Um, I I'm just looked, up, looked up in the talents. I don't have that many. I think it's 400, maybe 397 or 400 or something like that. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of them that don't really Probably log in. Somebody will they, identify with it, huh? Yeah, they listen to the study, you know. I, there's quite a few of them, but they're not everybody logs in as far as subscribe, you know. Um, but um, there's like 71 subscribers, I think. But if, but if I go to the tell, it's, it's like it says like 3, 397, but that's throughout the whole world. <laughs> I mean, yeah. YouTube, is, it goes throughout the whole world. It goes everywhere. I, uh, I don't know if I told you it was less than a year ago, but uh, I, I carried the AA message down in Palos Verdes at a meeting in a, in a Catholic church, St. John's. But the meeting room was, was open for us, and that was put on, on Zoom and sent to... Uh, all the way to Africa that night, some people tuned in from us and, and I told my story, but the live audience there that night and my friend Jeff wrote, drove down there with me. Uh, the audience probably had 16 to 20 kids, teenagers in there. And I thought, I thought yeah, I'm 74 years old. What can, what can I tell a teenager? Because I remember what I was like as a teen. I wouldn't listen to anything anyway. But uh, I'm thinking, this is going to be interesting. I was worried what I was going to say to the kids. But while I was talking to my audience, I make a lot of eye contact with people. And when I was describing what I was feeling like when I was a teenager and how I felt clumsy and awkward and out of place, and, and I was describing some of the feelings I was talking about earlier, the night I had my first three beers, um, I was talking more about my feelings and how they were changing right there that night. And I'm watching these kids sitting out in the audience and they're nodding their heads like, yep, they were identifying with me. And I realized when it was all done, because we usually wait and, uh, and then a lot of the people want to come up and shake your hand and thank you and stuff. I had like a dozen kids came up to me and thanked me. He said, I'm really glad you came here. I really, I really identified with what you said. And I, and I thought, well, now I know how to identify with kids. I talked about the feelings that I had when I was their age. And I was worried that they wouldn't get my message. They got it better than the adult did. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I have, there, there's a whole audience there for me, kids that need help. Yeah, and I can help them just just by sharing what I have. Right. We're we're, we're non denominational in AA, but yeah, I have no problems about talking about God as long as we don't mention Jesus Christ. And sometimes I do that anyway, just to irritate people. But <laughs> no, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Right. I, I wouldn't want a Muslim in starting to talk talk about Allah in a meeting or or Muhammad and, and throw their butt out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's an outside issue yeah yeah i mean that that's you know that's what i do too i mean when i get called to talk to some of the youth, the youth? you know i do that <clears throat> i do that because you know they're they're the generation they're the next generation that's coming and boy do they need some you know um, they need some guidance they're not getting at home or at school yeah, it's almost criminal what schools are teaching now. Yeah. All the gender gender fluidity crap. 
Yeah. You know, telling boys that they're girls and girls that they're boys and that they can have a baby if you're a man and all that. Crazy. And they're teaching it in public schools. It's crazy. That's what I was preaching also in, in on Saturday. You know, once again, I was preaching Proverbs 18.22. It says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You know, but but notice how it doesn't say, well, it, doesn't, it, it says, it says he who finds a wife finds a good thing, right? But it doesn't say he who finds a he. It says he who finds yeah. a wife. Yeah. And, and and your wife is not a, your wife is not a he. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know? And it goes both ways, you know. Uh, I mean, today you're, um, you live like man. You're not so much in fear that you're you you know another man's going to take your wife, but another woman's going to take your wife. <clears throat> well, when, when you look at uh, there's an admiral in the U.S. Navy that sits on the what are, how are they call them the chief council, you know, the top five generals and stuff. Uh -huh. And it's a man that thinks he's a woman. Mm. Is the head person of the whole United States Navy. And you know, he's a man. He talks like a man. He has a Adam's apple, but he, he dresses like a woman, wears dresses and makeup. And it's sick. It's really sick. And yeah. we have a president that condones it and tries to promote it. Crazy. I like the, you know, the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter five, verse 20, he says, whoa, for them to call evil good and good evil. And he says, whoa, for them to call evil good and good evil. I mean, that's yeah. why, schools, I mean, think about our schools, you know, I mean, we want God to protect our schools when we threw them out of, threw it out of the school system and, and then we expect God to protect our children from a madman going in there shooting the kids. Look what we've done to our schools. <clears throat> Look what we've done to our marriages, to families. And why? Because we throw God out. <laughs> it's, it's the, you know, I try not to talk about politics because I get worked up. No, I know. But it's, the, it's the whole Democratic Party. It's the whole party. So. Yeah. My microphone was muted, so I touched something. Yeah, it it uh, it turned off your your camera. Yeah, I can't see you either. Yeah, you touch at the bottom of your phone, and you'll see where it says. Uh, it says done speaking, and it says your video was stopped, but I don't see anything there. It says leave, but I'm not leaving. No, uh, towards if you touch the bottom screen. I don't know why the video is gone. I can hear you. Yeah, towards the, your screen, it's going to say, um, it's going to say video. Yeah, it says my video has stopped, but there's nothing there to touch to start it back up. If you tap on the video, it'll, it'll bring your, your camera back on. Where it says video? Yeah. Your video has stopped. Well, I'm pressing it, but nothing's happening. At the bottom or towards the middle? No, it's up above where I have a round circle that says done speaking. Before it said I was muted, so I hit it and unmuted it. But And then up at the top right, it says leave. And no, don't push that one. No, safe driving mode, whatever that means. Uh, let me see how we can get you back. Yeah, you got mute. If you tap at the bottom of your phone, it says mute. No, it doesn't say mute. It just says done speaking. I guess when I'm done talking, I'm supposed to hit that. Mm. I don't know how to get you back. Other than touch your screen in the middle. And yeah. then... I don't know how to take a screenshot of this either. Maybe I can. I'll show it to you later. I'm going to try this if I lose you, and I'll talk to you later. Yeah, because my screen, if I touch my screen, <clears throat> what, come, what shows up in the bottom, it says, 
mute, stop video, then it shows participants, chat, reflections. I said press home to open, so I did. Did I cut you off? No, I'm still here. Well, I got you on audio, but no video, so I don't know. All right, we'll just we'll just pray out. All right. And then if you want to share something in the end, you can. Okay. So Lord, we want to give you all the glory and all the praise for allowing us, Father, to bring uh, uh, Brother Jim's testimony out in the open, Father, for others to be to listen and to hear and to be set free, knowing that uh, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. We thank you, God, for his calling. We thank you, God, for his ministry. And Lord, we pray that others, Lord, will also be touched by his testimony. Lord, we ask that you go before us. In Jesus' precious name, we pray for our nation. And Lord, for our, con our country, our nation, Lord, and, and, our, and our cities in general, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Lord, I want to thank you for sending Plumber John to AA because he's the one who introduced me to Robert. Mm. And um, we don't meet people by accident. I, I've been learning this for many years now. You know, there's a, one story I read in, in the AA Big Book, and the guy said there, there are no accidents in God's universe. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, everybody's there for a reason, and uh, it's all a blessing, and it's uh, thankful to you, Lord. So I want to thank you and praise God, praise Jesus, and uh, in Jesus' name, mm. amen. All right, brother. Okay. Thank Thanks. You, brother. And I'll see you. you at the shop sometime. Amen. Okay. Thanks, okay. Robert. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you.